paleo nerds. Two grown men. One plays with dolls. The other draws dinosaurs with crayons. Together they explore the prehistoric past with experts from across the globe. Paleo nerds. Because deep time will blow your mind. <laughs> say, say it again. <laughs> hey, Ray. Hey, Dave. How are you doing, man? I'm good. I really yelled loudly in that hey, Ray there because I was so excited to see you. Well, it's always great to see you as well, my friend, however we are doing it these days, <laughs> digitally or in person or whatever it is here in the uh, cyberspace world. But digitally means you're using your fingers. Oh, it's true. Yeah, okay. Whatever. So, Dave, how you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'm in Ojai, California, and we're still in, uh, I don't know, three months of lockdown, and uh, everybody's starting to open back up. My county has suddenly an increase in hospitalizations from the zombie apocalypse. Yes, we've been adding cases almost daily here in Ketchikan and throughout Alaska now, so it's what we're dealing with, man. Well, just wait till the great second wave hits this autumn in the Northern Hemisphere. We are going to be freaking. Yeah, but science is going to save us, man. I agree. Science will save us, which is my first question. How does paleontology, the study of old, how does that help us now in the, in, let's say, defeating COVID and finding a vaccine? How does paleontology help us? The study of old, the study of ancient life. I think when Mr. Charles Darwin published the On the Origin of Species and uh, brought up this idea of evolution, that things change, things are not static. Life does go on. Life does find a way. Life finds a way. Life uh, will probably be here after us. I know it will be here after us. But uh, science is knowledge, man, and knowledge is what we're going to use to defeat a tiny little thing that we cannot see. So there. So the study of old helped forward science into its current state today. Yeah, I think we have to understand where the planet has been and where we come from and what we are, right, to know what we're dealing with. And uh, this is a pathogen that's coming from animals, apparently and um, how it moves through the animal populations. It's, it's science. It really is going to defeat, defeat this thing and save us. So, boom. Yeah. All right. Well, power to all those scientists out there finding a vaccine. Yeah. I'd like to think that the entire world, the best minds on the planet are all working on this. So. Quick update. Although this was recorded two months ago in June 2020, not much has changed in Ojai, Ketchikan, or America in general. I really thought we could do better than that. Yeah. <laughs> in the meantime, yeah. we're talking paleo, man. Paleo. But no, I want to talk Alaska. I miss Alaska so much. I really do. Uh What's it like? Are the fisheries open? Are there like hundreds of fishermen arriving to work the fishing boats and the gill netters and all that? Or the, or the scene? What are they called? The saners. The saners. Forgive they're me. not saners? Yeah, they're not saners. Saners, yes. Forgive me, Father, for I have saned. Um, yes. Oh. To, I'm sorry, Dave. I have to do it. It's my job, man. But yes, there is a uh, large uh, body of uh, humanoids arriving in Alaska to catch the fish and to process the fish. And so that is going on. And that is actually where we're seeing some of the COVID cases, people coming in from the state, seafood plant workers who have to work side by side, but they're doing what they can to contain it. And how many people is that? Is it the same as last year? Is it the same every year? Well, the biologists are not predicting as big a catch this year, but it's usually, it's pretty steady as she goes. I like to think that we run a sustainable seafood industry up here in Alaska, at least with the salmon. But wait, wait, wait. Are the biologists, are, are they saying it's not going to be a big of a run or there's not enough fishing boats to catch them because of the COVID? No, there's, 
the fishermen will do what they always do. They'll catch what they're allowed to catch, but the biologists are predicting that there won't be as many fish coming back this year. But I am pleased to see that there are salmon now jumping at the mouth of the creek. I was down in the dock yesterday, and there were king salmon jumping. There were a couple of kids. Usually there's 30 people at the bridge casting their rods out, but there's just a couple of kids. And uh, they had not caught any, but uh, they said, look, over there. And I could see the salmon were jumping, king salmon, at the mouth of Ketchikan Creek. And then the cool thing, Dave, is I went down to the dock yesterday. I got all geared up, bought my own fishing gear and stuff. I haven't actually, I've been going out with charter fishermen for the last few years. But I went, got my own rig all set up and went down and I bottom fished off of the, uh, off the dock down here, Pier 3. Pier, uh, no, actually, uh birth one where the cruise ships are normally docked there's nobody there now but people are lining up and, and fishing down there they've been catching a lot of ratfish i was hoping to catch a ratfish i caught nothing <laughs> but <laughs> wait what were you using were you jigging with like a shiny lure or were you using bait or what? uh that's debatable <laughs> Oh my oh. God, Ray, Ray, Ray! Hey, sorry. Hey, I get paid for being a jerk. Don't do it for free. <laughs> uh, I I give away the puns for free, man. But um, the pun is the lowest form of humor, and I revel in that, man. I'm a bottom feeder all the way. And speaking of bottom feeding, when I arrived in the dock, this guy was down there. His name is Marco. I've been shooting the breeze with Marco. He's been catching nothing but ratfish. But yesterday, he had a 150-pound halibut on the line. Problem is, you're up on top of this dock, and there's like 30 feet down below. He gets this massive fish up. and goes, oh, my God. And he gets a friend of his to go down the ladder, and there's this epic struggle, and they get the gaff hook in it. The guy who went down the ladder ends up falling in the water and being towed by this massive halibut. And finally, boom, it breaks the line. And it's gone. That's right down there at, at Ketchikan downtown. Right yeah, there at the right docks. there. Right there. 150-pound halibut, they estimated. Yeah, yeah. And these guys know their fish. So they know that, he, I mean, he, he was being conservative in his estimate. So Right. So so you're saying that the top of the dock and the top of the sea, of the ocean, is a 30-foot drop at whatever the tide yeah, is. Yeah, whatever the tide is doing. Because this dock has to be so high because it services the cruise ships. Right, these cruise ships that are 10 stories tall. So we have this massive, massive dock downtown, but uh, now it's a great fishing spot, man. Yeah, I stupidly, in the 1980s, went out in a 25-foot boat with uh, three guys to steam into the Gulf of Alaska and nothing but beer, (laughs) beer and potato chips, fishing for 200-pound halibut. I don't even recall any emergency gear. I can't believe how stupid I was going out there with beer, potato chips, and a bunch of drunken hee-haws ooh, 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 to catch ooh, ooh, fish ooh. the size of small Volkswagens. And guns. We had guns to shoot the halibut before you get them on the boat. Yeah, you know, when, when you shoot a halibut, it's uh, actually pretty uh, – you need to shoot it in the water. <laughs> there yeah. have been yeah. cases of people, they bring the halibut, and then they've blown a hole through their boat, you know, and they – yeah, it's happened, so <laughs> – I have heard a story of a guy, and it's in my first book that I did, uh, Shocking Fish Tales, a guy named by the name of Joe Cash, who was out halibut fishing alone, apparently got the uh, massive halibut on, on the deck of his boat, and somehow, uh, as he was gaffing it, the halibut, as it began to thrash, broke his legs, uh, He the gaff hook kind of went into Joe somehow, and he bled to death, and they find this massive fish and this dead guy in a boat, so. Take heed, man. Oh my goodness. I heard the world record class for halibut from a sports fisherman is something like 490 or 500 pounds, something like that, around 500 pounds. Yeah, uh, they've been recorded even bigger, I think in the 600 pound range, but there's, if you go to the Anchorage airport, there's a massive halibut, on dis- taxidermy halibut on display there. And I think that's a 500 pounder. I heard rumors that Jacques Cousteau and his crew came up to Alaska once and they estimated seeing halibut at 900 pounds underwater. But everything looks bigger when you're scuba diving. <laughs> so, Ray, who's our guest today? You know him, don't you? I have been on a few fossil adventures with this man that we're about to meet. Yes. 
Uh, you're about to meet him. Yeah, yeah. And what is his field of study? Well, <laughs> I'm cold. He's way up north. He's in Fairbanks, and he is the director of the uh, University of Alaska um, Fairbanks Museum of the North. He's a longtime paleontologist. He studies polar dinosaurs. He's been digging way up in the north northern part of uh, Alaska, but he's also probably one of the world's I, I would say he's he's the guy if you want to talk marine reptiles uh mesozoic marine reptiles plesiosaurs ichthyosaurs and that kind of thing he's the man so uh so he's he's really a marine reptile guy but he's taking a big turn into dinosaurs as well polar dinosaurs sounds like an oxymoron because you think of dinosaurs in some sort of warm tropical environment but they're not they they existed on on all latitudes well they did exist on all latitudes we're going to hear more about that from pat he'll explain some of that stuff to us but uh all right and who is it pat druckenmiller all right that's a cool name let's uh give him a ring shall we we shall dial him up dave All right. So, uh, Ray, uh, who do we have on the line? Meet Pat Druckenmiller up in Fairbanks, Alaska. I think you're sitting in your office today, aren't you, Pat? I'm excited to be back in my office today. <laughs> Fairbanks, you're like really close to North Pole. We're north of North Pole. Oh, that's right. North Pole is south of Fairbanks, isn't it? There's a town. <laughs> <laughs> There's a town, right. Whereabouts is Fairbanks? Give us, uh, give us a picture, a mental picture of where you're at, man. Well, there's a... a um, in Alaska, we uh, we're, we're fond of showing the the map of Alaska on our on our hands. So if I um, if I do something kind of like that's an upside down dog shadow puppet. Okay, good. That works too. Ray's down here in Ketchikan, down in southeast Alaska. The upside down thumb. Yeah. If there's the Aleutian Islands, the Alaska Peninsula, Aleutia Islands. There's uh, Prudhoe Bay. Is up top. North Slope. Up top. Yeah, uh, we're we're pretty much smack dab in the middle of the state of Alaska, just about a degree south of the Arctic Circle. How many miles is that? Uh, I'd say, well, it's about a three-hour drive. <laughs> and right now, you are experiencing sunshine all day and evening long, right? It's uh, it's a beautiful time of year. Yeah, we're experiencing effectively twenty-four hours of of light a day. The te the sun technically sets this time of year at something like twelve thirty or one in the morning, and it rises at about three in the morning. So it's really just a glow on the horizon, uh, a very bright glow on the horizon, rather than any semblance of night. I remember coming out of a bar in Anchorage, Alaska at two in the morning and having the sun in my eyes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we. Um, uh, th this is a fun time of year to be experiencing Alaska. Of course, the converse is in the middle of winter, we get um, uh, that much darkness. So it is a very dark place. That can be a hard thing to live with. Uh, depends on your personality. So you, you get to work twice as much in the summer because you've got two two days in one day, right? So That's right. Yeah, they uh, change our work schedules. Uh, we have to do 14-hour um, <laughs> days, 14 to 16-hour days in the summer, but then we sleep all winter. Wait, you're serious, Ray? No, no. no. <laughs> oh. But I, I just remember the first time I did meet you, Pat, 10-some uh, years ago, and it was in the middle of the winter. I think we, Kirk and I came up in February to visit you and to meet you. That's right. And uh, I was amazed. Uh, it was like 40 below, but you were biking into work from your home out in the countryside. I was blown away by that. You are an Arctic dude, man. You, you thrive in the Arctic, don't you? I, I do like the challenges of cold winters. And biking biking during the winter is not that big of a deal down to about 20 below zero. And then when it gets below that, it starts to get a little trickier. Fall me at minus 20. Things change at minus 30, and they get actually cold at 40 below. And I have one minus 50 ride. Wow. So, so how did you become a paleontologist? Oh, my gosh. I was, I was, I was not a, like a dinosaur nerd as a kid. I didn't, I didn't grow up going, oh, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. I, I just was fascinated by all things natural history. And I think had life taken me in different directions, I could have as easily become an entomologist, uh, an ornithologist. Um, in fact, my, my undergraduate degree is in botany. The sound of leaves rustling. Um, I met a friend, a guy named Joe Schoolin, who is a paleontologist as well at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
and he really excited my interest in paleontology, which is a beautiful way to com combine earth science and, and biology. Joe had, uh, had this idea like, hey, why don't we go to western Kansas over spring break and collect mosasaurs, uh -huh. which are big marine lizards from the age of dinosaurs. A couple of pints later, this, was a, this became a great idea. And we we're actually able to pull that off. We borrowed a departmental van. We rounded up one or two other suckers. And <laughs> we drove right on the Friday afternoon of spring break down to western Kansas. Wow. And so began my career in vertebrate paleontology. And did you bag a mosasaur on that trip? We did actually wow. bag a mosasaur on that trip. I, I have to say, one of the most important things about being a paleontologist, I think, is learning that you, you don't operate in a bubble. We had previously made a connection with some landowners in that area because the area is mostly private land. And we actually called people up in advance and said, hey, my name's Pat. I'm calling from this little museum in Wisconsin. We'd like to come down and look at your land and see if we could find some fossils. Get off my land. And we were overwhelmed by the generosity of the ranchers in that area. And one of them went so far as to say, hey, you know, the weather in March can be nice or, or not. He said, why don't, why don't you stay at my calving house? And about three days into the trip, we had, we had success and uh, found what turned out to be the better part of a mosasaur sticking straight into the side of a hill. Wow. And that was fortuitous because a blizzard hit the next day <laughs> and we were uh, hunkered down in the house the rest of the trip. So this uh, mosasaur, it's lying horizontal. Did you find the tail? Did you find the jaw and teeth? Or, or what part of it did you find? And then realize, uh-oh, it's directly straight <laughs> into this hill we're going to have to excavate. <laughs> so there's a good story there, too. Uh, you know, at the time, I, I was completely new to vertebrate paleontology. What we found was uh, basically a bluff about 20 feet tall, and the, the rock there is chalk. Uh, it's called the Nybrera Formation, and it's chalk rock, which is fairly soft, but still something to contend with. So what exactly is the Niobrera Formation? It was once the bottom of the sea that separated North America during the late Cretaceous period, the age of the dinosaurs, around 87 million years ago, give or take a couple days. Now the Niobrera chalk Pat is talking about is made up of millions of coccoliths, little teeny tiny microorganisms that died, fell to the bottom of that shallow sea, and created seabed sediment. So many died over the millions of years that they formed a layer that in some places is 500 feet thick. You can find this fossil treasure chalk in Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and on an itty bitty corner of Iowa next to some corn. And what we saw sticking out of the rock was a vertebra. And we looked at it and we said, and we looked at the hill below it and we saw a pile of bones. And it sort of suggested that there looks like there's a skeleton going into the hill. So, and part of it had already weathered out. So we wondered, okay, are we going, you know, is the part of the body, the head end in the hill or is the tail end? And there's a way to tell with a mosasaur because a mosasaur as a, um, as a lepidosaur, it's actually a type, it's a lizard. The, the, the spool-shaped part of the vertebra, the centrum, has a concave end and a convex end. Mm -hmm. And any perfectly good vertebrate paleontologist will tell you that lepidosaurs are procelous, meaning that the concave end faces forward and the convex end faces back. So we were looking into the hill, looking at the vertebra, and we were looking at the convex end, and we were both asking ourselves, do you remember whether these are convex or <laughs> which concave? Way, which way? It was like, an inning or an outie. Ah, and what an was it? So it was going so, into the hill? So we had to go back that night and consult our, um, our vertebrate paleontology textbook, A.S. Romer's famous textbook. And sure enough, yeah. Uh, mosasaurs have the concave end forward, and we saw the convex end, meaning the tail had weathered out, but the head end was in the hill. Wow. And we were like, hallelujah. What was the genus of your mosasaur, and did you collect it, and where is it now? And how big was it? Great question. <laughs> so we couldn't tell from that at the time, but there's generally there are three well-known genera types of mosasaurs from that area. Clydastes, Platycarpus, and Tylosaurus. Tylosaurus is kind of famous because it's considered generally the biggest one. Um, as it turns out, we then came back that summer to excavate the skeleton. Long story short, uh, it's Platycarpus. That's the kind of mosasaur it turned out to be. 
and we were able to collect everything from about the hind, the hind limbs all the way forward through the torso. And as we dug into the hill, there was no skull. Oh, this is man. a common, a common problem. Oh. With... Okay, wait, explain why in death and subsequent preservation, a skull vanishes from the skeleton. <laughs> it's frustrating. It's, I've had this happen many times to me with ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs. You know, this is a weak link right here, right? The neck. This is one of the most susceptible areas to fall apart. And the head is often an area prone for attack uh, if, if an animal is attacked and killed. <laughs> Um, yeah. But even if it isn't, as the animal begins to disintegrate and fall apart, and often the head becomes disconnected from the rest of the body. Sometimes you'll find the skeleton and you dig a further and you find the skull. I've had that happen. In this case, we never, we dug beyond the, the torso and we never did find the skull, but we did find, once we found out from the torso and the limbs that it was platycarpus, we found another platycarpus skull of the same size that summer. And we, we prepared that skull, we prepared that skeleton. Did it match? And they did, yeah. Yeah, it was, cool. it was, a, good, it was a good fit. And so that skeleton is now- um, But it wasn't the same individual? It wasn't the same individual, just a different, but the same species. So that, that animal, um, actually two animals, is now hanging from the ceiling of uh, the University of Wisconsin Geology Museum. Wow. was looking at moving someplace west where I could be closer to the fossils, closer to the mountains. And, and lo, that came to be, did it not? And lo, that came to be. So I ended up moving to Bozeman, Montana and beginning my graduate work there at Montana State University and the Museum of the Rockies. And I was able to continue at that point working on marine reptiles, but focusing now on plesiosaurs, a whole new group of marine reptiles. And my work there eventually led me into doctoral work at the University of Calgary in, in Alberta. And I wow, you're just like going from dinosaur land to dinosaur land. E exactly. So the whole time I was, I was working, my research was on marine reptiles, but I was paying the bills by basically working on dinosaurs. So these marine reptiles are not technically dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are not marine creatures, but marine reptiles are a very phylogenetically diverse group of organisms. Well, and I so wanted I, to ask you about marine reptiles. So life, life as we know it started in the ocean and migrated to land and the rise of the dinosaurs after the Permian extinction. And we have reptiles who then decide, I don't like the land. I want to go back and live in the ocean. Can you explain how these reptiles became marine reptiles and, and why? Yeah, that's, a, that's always, that's a really good question. There were, at the end of that uh, huge extinction period, at the end of the Permian and moving into the Triassic period, the world's oceans were brand new opportunities for, for organisms to occupy. Um, so there were, there were fish in this broad sense of the term, but there is actually a lot of new ecological niches that could be exploited. Um, food resources that, that were available. Is that because the Permian extinction emptied out the oceans and opened up the rise for new it, environments? It, it did. It, it resulted in huge marine extinctions, um, particularly among invertebrate groups as well as vertebrate groups. And so the oceans were effectively open real estate. So then there's the question, okay, why go to sea? Like you don't just sort of stand there at the edge of the water and you look in and go, Hey, I think I'll start eating corals today or something like that. Galapagos iguanas eat that moss, right? And what do they do? They live an amphibious lifestyle. So presumably that, you know, that transition from fully terrestrial to fully aquatic wasn't a jump into the sea, as we like to call it. It was a gradual process, and it happened independently in several different lineages of reptiles. Pat, so here we are in the Triassic. The oceans are empty. And as Dave was saying, there's reptiles now living at the shore. And there's these groups that be different lineages that go back to the sea. And I'm wondering if you could just walk us through some of the major groups of reptiles 
the return of the sea because we've only basically with marine reptiles now we have turtles but there used to be a lot more so can you literally walk us through the groups as they walk back into the sea sure there were um what we call the age of dinosaurs the mesozoic in case you've forgotten the triassic jurassic and cretaceous periods are part of the mesozoic era which means middle life the mesozoic comes after the paleozoic which means old life and precedes the cenozoic era which means new life and that's the era we're in now. The Mesozoic era is known as the age of reptiles when really cool dinosaurs, marine reptiles, and flying pterosaurs all flourished during this era, lasting for 186 million years. It all came crashing to an end 66 million years ago when that giant rock from outer space hit our planet near the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out all the big dinosaurs and 80% of all species of animals and plants alive at the time. It was one very, very bad day for planet Earth. Anything bigger than a poodle was toast. But hey, it was a great time to be a tiny mammal. Yay, now it's our chance, yeah. We are all chicks who love survivors, man. What we call the age of dinosaurs, the Mesozoic, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Famous for all its diversity of reptile life on land, but in the oceans, it was equally fascinating. Independently, multiple groups of reptiles invaded these aquatic environments. One of the big ones was a group that we call Sauropterygia. Sauropterygia includes uh, plesiosaurs, which became mostly abundant through the Jurassic and Cretaceous, but its early members of this group occupied and began invading the sea, if you will, in the Triassic period. Um, if you've ever heard of things like nothosaurs, for example, or pachypleurosaurs, these are other members of this group, or placodonts. And, well, wait, uh, placodonts are armor-plated fish? No, those They're... are placoderms. <laughs> okay. Wait, what's a plaque? Wait, a placodont would be an armor plated dinosaur? Lizard, not a dinosaur. The names are very confusing. Yeah, so, so placoderms are a group of fish best known from the Devonian period back in the Paleozoic. Like Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus, Dave. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, it's Dunkleosteus, Dave. Placodonts are these things that at first glance you'd say look like a turtle, but they actually belong to this group of reptiles that we call sauropterygians. The earliest sauropterygians, spelled S-A-U-R-O-P-T-E-R-Y-G-I-A-N-S, appeared about 245 million years ago at the start of the Triassic period. They were semi-aquatic lizard-like animals with long limbs, but the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event wiped them all out except for the plesiosaurs. Bye-bye. Sorry, see you go. And they had big button-shaped flat shell-crushing teeth. They only lived in the Triassic period. They went extinct at the end of the Triassic. Um, but they're part of this larger group that, that then um, diversified and pleased. Well, wait, did they look like turtles? What they do they kind look of like? Look like turtles. Yeah. They, they actually yeah. had a, an armored, what we call little osteoderms, uh, bone in their skin that they used as presumably for protection. So they didn't look like a glyptodont, like one of those no, giant no. armadillo things. You know, but imagine an underwater glyptodont. Okay, okay. that's kind of what we're talking about <laughs> here. <but. laughs> for once, I sort of got it right. Glyptodonts were a genus of heavily armored mammals, relatives of armadillos, living during the Pleistocene epoch and becoming extinct around 10,000 years ago. They were roughly the same size and weight of a Volkswagen Beetle, but didn't get as good gas mileage. So like a giant marine reptile, what is the animal that's on land before it goes into water? What does that look like? We don't know. There, therein oh. lies the question. Now, presumably, most of yeah. these animals probably looked like an iguana lizardy looking thing. But um, what was interesting is how each of these different groups, when they went to sea, they took up uh, they took up different kinds of feeding, and most importantly, they took up different styles of locomotion. And one of the things that sauropterygians did, which culminated with plesiosaurs, is they modified their front and their hind limbs into these giant paddle-shaped structures. And I shouldn't say really paddle as much as a hydrofoil. They're, they look like an airplane wing. Now, there's no animal alive today that moves in the same way as a plesiosaur did. Wow. Can you explain that uh, for me, how the plesiosaur is so different in their motion and nothing alive today does that? Well, the only thing that comes close in general looks would be something like a sea turtle today. They have paddles of both their hind and their forefins, but their forefins are used for locomotion almost exclusively, whereas in plesiosaurs, it looks 
based on a variety of lines of evidence, it looks like they were using both the fore and the oh, hind limbs for propulsion. I see. I see. So um, you've been walking us through the different groups. We've right. talked about the placodonts, uh, the plesiosaurs, and the plesiosaurs are two groups, right? Plesiosaurs and pliosaurs, right? So let me just clarify that. So one of the neat things, this group we traditionally called plesiosaurs, more technically, we would call them plesiosaurians, and it includes a variety of different subgroups, some of which have relatively long necks and small skulls, and others that have relatively short necks and massive skulls, some of the largest ocean-going predators of their time. Like the tylosaur. Is a tylosaur one of those? A tylosaur is a mosasaur, so that's a different group. It's a mosasaur, yeah, Dave. Yeah. Mosas we're getting to those. That's the Cretaceous. <laughs> we're still in the Triassic, man. Jeez. But in my head, uh, in my head, I'm, vis I'm visualizing as you're speaking because this is uh, on the radio. This is a podcast. Oh, is it? They're, they're yeah. So they're long neck plesiosaurs and short neck plesiosaurs. Yes. yes. The short necks are called pliosaurs. Well, mosasaurs are a later invasion, right? So I know this gets confusing, but walk it, us, take us back through it, doctor. It, it used to be that if, if you picture something that looks like a Loch Ness monster, that's what we used to call a plesiosaur. So a plesiosaur is generally thought of as this marine reptile with a long neck and a relatively small skull, even though the animal overall might be 40 feet long. That's longer than a school bus. And then we used to think, well, then there are things with short necks that we called the pliosaurs. They're all a group, they're all members of this group plesiosauria. But what we've sent, realized, there wasn't a group of just long neck plesiosaurs and a group of short neck plesiosaurs. But it, during their evolutionary history, neck length was highly plastic, skull size was highly plastic. And in fact, what we see is in some groups have both long and short neck members and other groups have long and short neck members. So there's no just long group, long neck group, short neck group. And so it's mother nature. Isn't that just like her? She's always throwing ringers in there. And that's a good example of convergent evolution where different groups took on similar body shapes as they evolved throughout their history. Wow. And then there's one other major group we haven't talked about, the ichthyosaurs. Do they fall yes. within? How are they related to the plesiosaurs or not at all? Well, wait, 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 no, hold on. There's, <laughs> there's ichthyosaur, mosasaur, and pliosaurian, right? Well, they're, okay, so the three biggies are plesiosaurs, there's ichthyosaurs, and mosasaurs. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because you left out mosasaur, Ray. And, and a tylosaur. I was getting to that, man. A tylosaur is a kind of mosasaur. And, and so let's, yeah, let's talk about ichthyosaurs. So ichthyosaurs, this was the very earliest group of marine reptiles that we know of that really pretty much showed up um, very soon after the giant Permian extinctions. One branch, which we eventually became ichthyosaurs, these are the animals that look a lot like modern day cetaceans, like dolphins and whales, for example. Ichthyosaurs started out small in the early Triassic. The earliest members of this group were literally a meter long or less, but through time, they became some of the largest marine reptiles. By the end of the Triassic, only like 20, 30 million years later, some members of this group rivaled the size of blue whales today. They were among the large, some of the largest vertebrates that ever lived on the planet. And they- How big? So the largest one that's ever been collected is actually, a, it's an ichthyosaur called uh, Shonosaurus, and it was found From Canada. in British Columbia. And I was actually part of the team that excavated this animal. It was uh, my former advisor, Betsy Nichols, was in charge of this project. And the specimen is actually at the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology in Alberta. I've seen the photos of that. It was along yeah. a stream bed, right? Yeah, yeah. You didn't want to take a step back too far. Otherwise, it was like game over. Uh, it was a pretty, <laughs> pretty fast moving river. So how big was that animal and how big was its head? Yeah, and so that animal had a skull. Uh, so we didn't collect all the skull, but we collected a lot of it. Um, and the skull was over four meters long, probably five meters long in actual life. And the whole animal itself was 21 meters long. So we're talking about a 75 foot long animal, basically. Oh, wow. Oh my God. No and way. And that's a 20 foot long head? Yep. Wow. These are massive. And so it and unfortunately was missing the long, narrow part of the, of the rostrum, of the snout. And so how they, big, wait, didn't ichthyosaurus have massive eyes with scler sclerotic rings? And how yes. big was its eye? And why were their eyes so big? All the better to see you with, my dear. 
that's one of the things about this group is that unlike uh, plesiosaurs, for example, this group, these were very clearly visual predators and they probably were specializing feeding on things like relatives of squid, cephalopods, which are known to bioluminesce and in low light conditions, large eyes are very advantageous for that. Wow, that gives me quite an image, man. I'm just, uh, re- wow, I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing that, these, these glowing animals. I've never really thought about that in the big eyes. Wouldn't big eyes also mean real deep water foraging? Exactly. It wouldn't have just been adv- advantageous in one, one setting necessarily. But the point being that ichthyosaurs, based on their body shape, they were also probably some of the fastest swimming large predators in the ocean, probably on average faster than your average plesiosaur. So they were very fast moving active predators, pursuing prey that would have included things like squid, but certainly also things like fish, and in some cases, uh, probably other marine reptiles as well. So a, a very diverse group, and of all the groups, Ichthyosaurs are interesting because they showed up really early in the Triassic. Their heyday was during the Triassic and Jurassic, and oddly enough, they went extinct as a group about halfway through the Cretaceous period. They didn't go extinct at the same time as all the dinosaurs did on land. It's a bit of a question why that was the case. Well, isn't that the case where we think that uh, Mosasaurs replaced them in the Cretaceous? Outcompeted them and filled that niche? Yeah, and so there's a good segue into our last big group of marine reptiles, Mosasaurs. Um, unlike ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, we don't really know how those major groups of reptiles fit into the big family tree of reptiles. But we do know that mosasaurs are lizards. They're perfectly good squamates. In case you didn't know, and I certainly didn't, squamates are collectively known as scaled reptiles and fall under the order of squamata, which is the largest order of reptiles comprising of lizards, snakes, and amphisbanians, which are legless worm lizards. Say that 10 times with crackers in your mouth. Squamates have over 10,000 species and it's the second largest order of living vertebrates after the fish. So we know where they fit into the big family tree. This particular branch became what we call secondarily aquatic in the Cretaceous period. And it's it's an interesting observation that about the time ichthyosaurs went extinct, mosasaurs started to really take off, became globally widespread. They became big, they became diverse. And was that in the Cretaceous? Or in the middle uh, It was Cretaceous. actually about halfway through the Cretaceous, about 90 million years ago. So there, there may be a connection. Okay, wait, here's a weird one for you. Have you found any stomach contents or gastroliths in any of these marine reptiles? Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. A gastrolith is a small stone swallowed by a bird, reptile, or fish to aid digestion in the gizzard. Weight watchers eat your heart out. Have you found remains of mosasaurs in plesiosaurs, or remains of plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. We don't have a ton of gut contents from all these things, but mosasaurs were definitely eating all sorts of things, including probably other mosasaurs. Some of the big pliosaurs, the big short-necked plesiosaurs, were probably eating other types of plesiosaurs, as well as lots of different types of invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, Most of the gut contents from ichthyosaurs are either fish or cephalopods, things like... Ammonites. uh, Yeah, squid-like relatives. But they certainly had the capability of eating. Any of these groups could have eaten pretty much anybody else. So there's a beautiful fossil on display at the uh, Sternberg Museum in Hayes, Kansas right now, uh, where my buddy Chuck Bonner has a platycarpus with a belly full of belemnites. Yeah. So, and that's a newly discovered gut content thing. That's cool. Belemnites are those long uh, shelled cephalopods. Cephalopods, yes, they're the but they're long. Shell. They're the long shell. Those are baculites. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Talk to me. What's the difference between belemites and baculites? If I may jump in, a baculite is a, a true ammonite with an exterior shell, pretty much like a cigar shape, a very long cigar or tube, if you will, slightly curved. But a belemnite, they flourish more in the Jurassic, I guess. Yeah. Right, Pat. Yeah. And they're an internal shell of a squid-like animal. Right? Am I correct? Correct. Absolutely. They look like big bullets, basically. 
They're like the uh, the little thing you find on the beach from a cuttlefish, something like that. But very, uh, very round. Right. And very heavy and solid. So it's an internal bone from the inside of a soft body creature. An internal shell. Shell, don't say bone. It's made of calcium carbonate. Incorrect again, Dave. Okay, I have a weird question here. So lizards go to the ocean and turn into marine reptiles. Have any of them gone back? back to land or is there any evidence of any creature on planet earth that went from obviously we all came from the ocean to land then to the ocean then back to land again that's a great question and that's been the matter of some debate and two groups in particular might actually owe their origins to a marine ancestry in other words uh, groups of animals today reptiles we recognize namely turtles and snakes that people suggested might have actually had the earliest part of their evolutionary history starting in the oceans. So at the moment, we still have this really crazy situation where, to our knowledge, only once for sure in the history of vertebrates did a group of vertebrates go from the ocean to land. But the converse was true where animals went from land to sea. That occurred dozens of times in the evolutionary history of whales and dolphins were terrestrial animals. Exactly. It happened many times in mammals. It happened many times in reptiles. And so it's, it's what I think is always very interesting is that in dinosaurs, proper true dinosaurs, did it ever happen to them? And the standard answer to that has always been no. Recently, it's been suggested that one of the biggest, scariest dinosaurs of all, Spinosaurus, may actually have been an aquatic dinosaur. That was the recent discovery of the paper that came out. It was an analyzing the tail vertebra or the structure within the tail suggested it was used for locomotion in the water. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the big distinctions that dinosaurs are terrestrial. And they had not begun the transition back to water. And any paleo nerd will tell you any day of the week that plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, placodonts, they're not dinosaurs. Correct. These are marine reptiles. Wait, weren't they dinosaurs to begin no. with? No, 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 they're not dinosaurs, dude. Incorrect, Dave. No, Dave. No. Well, well, wait, okay. Define, <laughs> define dinosaur. Terrible lizard. Pat, define... Can you straighten this up for my ventriloquist friend here? <laughs> yeah, I'm a ventriloquist. I'm talking out my ass right now. Apparently, <laughs> yes. So in a biological sense, we, we always like to define groups on the basis of shared ancestry. So everything that we call a, a whatever, a dinosaur, plesiosaur, they should all share a common ancestor, a more recent common ancestor amongst themselves than with anything else. So dinosaurs as a group are all defined not on the basis of where they live or when they live. They're all defined on the basis of a series of discrete physical features that they owe because they all share a common ancestor. Which are holes in the skull. Yeah, so one of those big features has to do with the fact they are a subgroup of diapsid reptiles. So in other words... Diapsids, right, right, right. They all right. have... Oh my God! You're holding up a massive skull. Exactly. Oh, that's a duckbill, hedgesaur. A duckbill duck dinosaur skull. And I'm pointing here to two holes in the back of the skull that make them a diapsid reptile. Diapsids are lizards, snakes, crocodiles, dinosaurs, and flying reptiles, the pterosaurs. They also have some features in the skull, like openings in front of their eyeballs called the ant orbital fenestra, which they share actually with things like crocodiles and flying reptiles. Told you so. But then dinosaurs are unique because of actually features that have more to do with, with their hind limbs and their mode of locomotion. They have a hole in their pelvis that you could sort of stick your hand through. Ouch. They have an upright posture. They walk up on the tips of their toes. These are distinct features of that group of reptiles that are shared by all dinosaurs. In contrast, something like a plesiosaur, even though we don't know exactly where this group fits into the big family tree very well of reptiles, we know that they all share, a, again, a certain suite of physical features, as do ichthyosaurs, as do mosasaurs. But what land animal, let's say during the middle of the Mesozoic, what land animal has the features not of a dinosaur, but of a marine reptile? We don't know of any. The very, very earliest history of these different groups of marine reptiles, um, and, and again, how they connect into the big family tree, it's just, we just don't know. It, we... Suddenly there's marine reptiles and you don't know where they came from? Uh, what, uh... what we have are, as you go farther back, 
we have transitional forms and we have animals that are clearly amphibious. They were not just strictly marine. We have animals that actually exhibit intermediate forms of reproductive behaviors. They all seem to be diapsid reptiles. More specifically, there's debates whether they're closer maybe to the branch that includes dinosaurs or maybe closer to the branch that includes lizards today. So there's so much diversity in the reptile family tree, and a lot of that, that transition happened back in the early Triassic. Yeah. Ours maybe did that in the Cretaceous. The nerd in me wants to know about Predator X, Pliosaurus, and whether or not Pliosaurus from Norway could take down Lyopleurodon. <laughs> You're the man to talk to. Tell us about Predator X and Norway. So going back, this, so this is back into our plesiosaur family tree side. So this big group of marine reptiles, plesiosaurs, two big sets of limbs that they use to sort of fly through the water, if you will. We have the long neck plesiosaurs, and then we have a group of the short neck plesiosaurs that we call sometimes pliosaurs. There is one specific kind called pliosaurus, and some of these pliosaurus skulls are, they're like seven, eight feet long. No way. They are seriously big skulls. And they have teeth that were as big around as bananas. Well, that's so bigger than a T-Rex. Exactly. Oh yeah, nasty. These are the top dogs in the late Jurassic seas as far as large bodied predators went. And their total body size, probably up to 35, 40 or more feet long. An impressive predator. Another type of pliosaur from England, from the late Jurassic, is called Lyopleurodon. And Lyopleurodon is one of those things that, um, it, was, it was a big animal, you know, a skull that five, six feet long. But it was, became a feature of a Walking with Dinosaurs show and a famous scene where this poor little dinosaur was walking <laughs> along close to shore and this big marine, nasty marine reptile came out of the water and grabbed it and pulled it in. There was no Lyopleurid on that size, I promise you. <laughs> oh, I loved, but I loved that scene. Little kids just like wet their pants looking at that going, oh, that is the coolest thing. Wait, didn't they do something like that in, in Jurassic Park? Something coming out of the water? That was a Mosasaur, Dave. Uh, but yeah. uh, you got to know those things. But Lyopleurodon, suddenly every paleo nerd kid, that's coming off the, you know, the tip of their tongue. They're very proud of this thing. But you've got an animal that shuts it down, right? Because we all want to know this. I became involved with the project with the Natural History Museum in Oslo, University of Oslo, collecting marine reptiles from the late Jurassic in Svalbard, which is a, an archipelago up off the northeast coast of Greenland, way, way, way above the Arctic Circle. We work up at about 78 degrees north. Whoa. You've got someone on uh, polar bear duty the entire time. Absolutely. You have to have that constantly. Um, be on the lookout for another large marine mammalian predator. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the finds that we made up there, we made a lot of finds, lots of discoveries of different types of ichthyosaurs, different types of uh, long and short neck plesiosaurs. But one of the biggest individual animals that we ever found was a, we recognize as a new species of Pliosaurus. So again, it's, it's, it's a big short neck plesiosaur, but this particular specimen was pretty impressively massive. We found teeth with just gargantuan, the cross-sectional shape of those, size of those wow. teeth. They're triangular actually. And again, they're bigger around than a, a, the largest T-Rex tooth I've ever seen. So you're talking a diameter of uh, three to four inches? A uh, diameter of, um, let's see here, I just... Yeah, do you happen to be holding one? <laughs> about three inches. They're not serrated, but they have these long ridges that help probably break, you know, break through um, skin and flesh. What kind of sediment were you finding this in? What kind of uh, strata? We were finding these in black shale, which normally is a pretty soft rock to dig in, but all of this shale is frozen solid. It's permafrost. And digging through a soft rock that's frozen is like digging through concrete. Uh, so we had to deal with, with that problem and excavating this and many other skeletons as well. You can't warm it up or, or heat it up with heaters? and You can. It turns out it makes a big muddy mess. Right. Right. And so we found that often the best strategy was to use jackhammers and rock saws, keep it frozen up until the point that you're actually out of the ground, and then you let it thaw. And that tends wow. to be an easier strategy. Well, one of the things you later named the animal Pliosaurus funkii or something like that. So the guy who found it that fateful day, his name's uh, Björn Funke. <laughs> and that's probably the proudest moment of Björn's paleontological career. He's an amateur paleontologist who part was one of the many volunteers that participated in these 
digs and made you know wonderful contributions to the project. In fact, all of the new species we named, part of the name included the name of a volunteer team member in recognition of their effort. So I'm curious, someone along the line ended up dubbing this thing Predator X. Yes. Well, and the press loved this, and it eventually became a really bad B-grade horror movie with flying pliosaurs. Have you watched it? I have not seen that Oh, movie. man. Where I, do I, I get a copy of this? <laughs> you can actually Google it up, Predator X, and it's a movie, and you can watch it online. So, But anyways, Predator no, X. No, thank you. No, thank you. Oh, come on. So wait, hold on a second. So... Predator X, and then let's transition to Ray Troll's neck of the woods, doesn't it? Around Southeast Alaska. What's this thalatosaur that you discovered? You named it? You prepared it? Uh, no, so there's a great story there. We've mentioned plesiosaurs. We've mentioned ichthyosaurs. We've mentioned mosasaurs. There is another group, a very lesser known group of marine reptiles only found during the Triassic period, and they're called thalatosaurs. Thalatosaurs? And thalatosaurs, we don't know that much about. They only lived in tropical waters. The biggest ones were probably only like 20 feet long. Many That's of them big. were- It's still big. It's still big. It's still big, <laughs> but most of them were probably like less than 10 feet long. And they're enigmatic and weird, aren't they? And they're very, very weird animals. And one of those spectacular new skeletons was found in Ray's backyard down in Southeast Alaska. Oh, yeah. How was it discovered? Jim Bachtel, who's the geologist for the Tongass National Forest, which is, they own most of the land of Southeast Alaska. He was out with a crew of friends and volunteers looking at one particular island in Southeast Alaska that had been known to produce some fossils of bones before. The rocks are Triassic aged. They went out on this fateful day at a really, really low tide because in Southeast Alaska, finding fossils is all about going out at low tide. And uh, one of the guys, he saw some bones coming out of the rock, uh, just a series of articulated vertebrae. And he said, Jim, come here, what, what's this? And Jim looked at it and he said, wow, that looks really cool. I have no idea. Let's send a picture to Pat. So he's standing on the outcrop. He pulls out his flip phone. <laughs> And he dials me up and I'm sitting in my office in Fairbanks and we start chatting. He tells me about this thing he just found with, with, with Gene. And I said, send me a picture. And I'm looking at them now on my computer screen in Fairbanks minutes later. And I said, that's not like a plesiosaur relative and that's not an ichthyosaur. There is this weird group of reptiles called thalatosaurs. That could be what it is. We did an, end up excavating the specimen. It took four years to prepare, clean up the skeleton. It turned out to be this spectacular, gorgeous skeleton, about a meter long of a new species of thalatosaur. And um, knowing it was a new species, we realized, hey, this animal needs a name. And Ray suggested to use the name of a Clinkett animal from their culture. Which uh, is a Native American tribe in Southeast Alaska, yes, one of them. The Clinkett people, yes. And that, that name is Gunakadate. In the end, we ended up naming the genus name Gonacodate, and the, the second part of the name, the species ending, we named Josii, which is the name of Gene's mother, the guy who found it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Gonacodate is a clinket story passed down through the ages about a, a mythical sea monster that actually ends up helping villages, and it's a gift-giving sea monster. It just seemed like a a beautiful name, and uh, the fossil was found not too far from a, a clinket town uh, called Cake, Alaska. But we went through the proper protocol to, to name the beast and, uh, and asked the elders and got approval from uh, Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation, so it was really wonderful. So I've seen photos and pictures of this skeleton. The thalatosaur is so weird looking because it has a triangular head with a very pointy snout. I mean, it looks like a complete triangle point, mm -hmm. doesn't it? What yeah. would be the physiological adaptation for having, is that someone that, that roots around in the mud or, or what? Well, that was, that was the million dollar question. Um, I'll say that no other thalatosaur has a, a snout 
that pointy and that sharp, pincer-like, like a pair of needle nose pliers. No other thalatosaur is quite like that. Does it have four it's, flippers? It's got four little flippers. They look, this animal is probably amphibious. Um, so it's like a pliosaur with four flippers or is it four flippers like a turtle? They weren't long and narrow quite like that. These were, were shorter. They were glorified limb. They were using their tail mostly for propulsion and not their limb. Like an iguana in, in the water. Yeah, yeah. The question was, yeah, what did it use this incredibly pointy snout for? Looks like an arrow. Yeah. Looks yeah. like an arrowhead. An yeah. arrowhead, yeah. The cool thing about it is there's two other things I'll just mention real quickly. One is it didn't have teeth at the very tip of the snout. It only had teeth in the back half of its mouth. And the other thing it had, there's a series of bones in the throat area. It's called the hyoid apparatus. Here's a fun fact. A hyoid apparatus is a collective term used in veterinary anatomy for the bones which suspend the tongue and larynx. The hyoid apparatus resembles the shape of a trapeze or a bent letter H. Weird. And these are the places where tongue muscles attach. And this animal had a really well-developed hyoid area. And we suggested it might have been using that for suction feeding. And we think it was using the pointy snout to probe into cracks and crevices underwater in reef areas. And this animal lived in a reef environment and was using it to extract small soft-bodied prey that it would basically grab with its snout and then use suction feeding to draw into the mouth and swallow. You know, it's amazing. So you think of million ye of years of a habit and the habit for feeding turns into a physical adaptation and an actual change in muscles and skeleton. Yeah, crazy. I tried to envision it. How does evolution take place? How does the actual physical changes? It just blows me away when you think about adaptation and, and how things change. What would have happened in this instance was, you know, some members of this species would have been born with slight variations in features associated with the shape of their snout, the location of their teeth, the size of their musculature and their tongue. And, and those animals that had those features that were advantageous then were more likely than to get passed on to their progeny. And the frequency of that particular feature would then become increasingly greater in a well, population. Well, they would reproduce and survive, and the and ones that produce. didn't would die out. Exactly. And there's evolution in a nutshell. Well, I'm wondering, Pat, you say that you were not a paleo nerd as a kid, but what's the coolest fossil that you've ever found? Besides the mosasaur. <laughs> What's the coolest fossil, like, whoa, that you have found? I feel lucky because I, I've been doing continuous field work for 30 years in a row, and I've been lucky to have found a lot of really cool things. Back in Kansas days, finding a fairly complete skeleton of Hesperornis, which is a toothed diving bird that lived at that mm -hmm. time, fairly rare find. Finding that skeleton was pretty eye-opening to me. We ended up mounting that skeleton for display at our museum and doing so mounted it in a way that every single bone could be taken off the stand without any extra effort really. No bones were harmed. The, the mount allows the bones to be removed and looked at and studied. Wow. One of the other cool things I think of, the last summer in Svalbard that we worked in the Jurassic, one of the team members found a skeleton of a plesiosaur it was a long-necked plesiosaur, and like so many of these that we had found previously, as we started to trace the neck vertebrae farther and farther into the hill towards the head, we get excited and more excited because we think, maybe this one will have the skull. And we got all the way up to those last two special vertebrae at the end, just behind the skull, and we dug a little further, and there was no skull. Oh! Oh! At this point, like I'm in the hole, horrible weather. You have to, it's like 33 degrees, raining, sleeting. I'm sitting on ice. I've been sitting Catch on ice. Catch a can weather. <laughs> it was miserable. Worse. And by this time, everybody in the group was standing around as I was getting right up to the very end of the neck where there was no skull. And it, it just wasn't there. And everybody finally left. And I had a little bit more space that I could dig out beyond that. So now I'm getting like several feet away from the end of the neck. We're literally packing up today to go home. <laughs> um, I'm gonna pull out the rock hammer and I'm just gonna go wham, 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 last ditch effort to see if I could find anything. And I went wham, 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 and I stopped.
and I don't know why, but I looked down and I realized that I had hit a chunk of rock this far from the tip of the snout oh. of the skull, which had dislodged and moved about two, two and a half, three feet away from the skeleton. And the skull was six to seven inches long on an animal that was probably 15 feet long. Wow. And it was a complete skull. Beautiful. Wow. Why were their heads so small? That we don't know. This, by the way, this thing was just published and named about a month ago. How many vertebrae? This particular one had 42 neck vertebrae. I think that's... Are they different numbered vertebrae and all these different creatures? They are. Yeah. Yeah. So like a giraffe and a human have the same number of bones. It's a lot more plastic in reptiles, but yeah, there was... Right. What's the name of the beast? So it's called Ophthalmophuli. Must have a big eye. Yeah, because this particular thing, when we cleaned up the skull... Relative to its skull, it had one of the largest, proportionally one of the largest eyeballs or eye sockets of any plesiosaur we've ever found. Hmm, interesting. That's for deep, dark night dives. Potentially, yeah. Speaking of deep and dark, hey, Pat, if you could time travel back in time, what geologic age would you go to <laughs> and what would you want to see? I've thought about this a lot and I would totally get hung up on this one, but I would probably want to go somewhere into the late Cretaceous and I would probably want to go somewhere into Western North America to just check out the dinosaurs, frankly. Because they're at the height of the diversity just before that asteroid hit and uh, boy, that would yeah. be an amazing ecosystem, wouldn't it? Why did Crichton get Jurassic Park so wrong? <laughs> why, why did he call it? Because Cretaceous Park doesn't sound good? You know, part of that story theoretically started out when he came to visit Egg Mountain, which is a site I worked at in western Montana for many years, a place where a lot of the first dinosaur eggs came from in North America. And he visited two years before I started working there. Theoretically, this idea for this book came up around the campfire one night um, at Egg Mountain, which is why it actually in the movie started theoretically at that place. You uh, run a museum? I do, yeah. Okay, and so you're a, an educator, you're an academic, you have a doctorate. Um, I always ask this question of all our guests, science is under attack. There are people yeah. out there who are using propaganda and social media to say that opinion is fact, and they're challenging science, which is usually proven to be fact. And if it's not proven to be fact, it's certainly under peer review. Mm -hmm. So what can we do as a society and what can you do as a museum academic to further science and the idea that science is real? That's a great question. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, when we all see each other as human beings and we bridge that divide of like, you're a member of this group and you're a member of this group, and we see each other as human beings, I think there's a lot more understanding and there's a lot less tendency to go off to extremes, left or right. And I think that's a job that all of us in academics, in museums, that's something we should all really try to do is to make as many of those personal connections as, as possible. Museums are a great place to do that because we Anyone can walk into our building and we can share these stories with them. And, you know, you're welcome not to like it or believe it. But frankly, the evidence is sitting there right in front of your face. You either tell me that I went into the back room and I carved this thalatosaur skeleton out of rock, or you look at it and go, hmm, looks real to me. And then you can just be fascinated by it. There's real people studying things because they like them. And from that information, we can do really important things to help the world. Well, you know what I think is beautiful about that? That's a great uh, summation to really connect with people, to have empathy. And it's just wonderful to think of a museum as a window into the world of science and to connect on yeah. a real personal, experiential basis. You can uh, behold that the lattice source. Great thought. Thanks, Pat. Have to come back and talk to you about polar dinosaurs. Were you with Pat when you went up to the North Slope there and found uh, your famous tooth? You found the only theropod tooth on that dig that one day. Or on something? that on that one dig, but yeah, Pat took me out there and brought me back alive. Uh, it's a skill, <laughs> and he fed me well except for the curried spam. If he's hungry, he'll eat it. 
Oh, Kevin. wait a minute. I did. I read that one of the hallmarks of your expeditions is you have the best food, uh, and that's the key to surviving a hard dig. It is important, and I thought we ate fine on that trip. We've, um, <laughs> we, were, we were a little bit in between funded field work the summer that, that Ray and Kirk came out with us, so we've actually eaten better some years before and after. Sorry, Ray, I didn't. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I thought we ate well, I mean, except for the curried spam. Hey, well, thank you so much for this, Pat. It was awesome talking That's to you. That's fun. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. I have to go back to Fairbanks. I was there in the 80s. I was in Barrow in the 80s. Wait a minute. Isn't there a plesiosaur in the Matanuska Valley? There is a skeleton that needs removing, and I'd be happy to have you come along for some of the fun. Yeehaw! It's about halfway up a cliff. It's another one of those classic Alaska excavation problems. Following with the theme of this whole show, wonder if there's a head at the end of that neck, right? And, and this one, we know for sure they're, it's going the right way into the hill. Good yeah. to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pat. Our guest is Pat Druckenmiller. He is the director of the Museum of the North at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Was he not awesome, man? I told you we would go way deep into Mesozoic marine reptiles, and we did. Yeah, and we never got to polar dinosaurs. We did not, and there is so much more to talk to him about. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can dial in another time to talk dinos with the man. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to talk to him about the soft-shelled egg that they found. In Antarctica, I believe. They think it is a mosasaur egg. I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to talk to him about that because I know of fossils of mosasaurs with baby mosasaurs in their belly. And it's not a meal that they had. Oh, right, right. So and, it's a pregnancy. And apparently they, and there you could look this up. There are papers that say mosasaurs gave live birth. And so maybe this new discovery, there'll be some pushback. That's the world of science, man. That's why it's fun. And yeah. now we know all yeah. about it. If this thing looks like a crumpled egg, you know, like a soft-bodied uh, snake or lizard egg. Was it found in marine sediments in Antarctica or, or what? It must have been if they're saying it's from a marine reptile. It must have been. I've just heard a little bit about this. I'm going to dig into it because I want to know it because, like I said. It's big. It's is like, it? It's like the size of a watermelon, yeah, or a football. Size of a football, yeah. Oh, wow. It's crazy. All right. Well, yeah. uh, I'm going to get to the bottom All of right. that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We will have an informed uh, opinion, sir. Yes, because okay, cool. we are paleo nerds. All right, buddy. I will talk to you later. And thanks. Right. Uh, this is Dave in Hawaii, California. This is Ray Troll signing off from beautiful Ketchikan, Alaska. Thank you for listening to Paleo Nerds. Make sure to like and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening. If you want to learn more about what you heard today, check out our website, paleonerds.com. You'll find tons of pictures and links, including photographic evidence that today's guests and your hosts have been Paleo Nerds for a long, long time. Again, that's paleonerds.com. Thanks for listening.